Hi there, this is Dr. Evan Osar with the Institute for Integrative Health and Fitness Education. Welcome to this edition of Integrative Movement Insider, and this is part one of a four-part series on working with your clients that have psoas, glute, and or low back issues related to posture and movement strategies. And more specifically, working with, with those clients that have chronic issues and they've been told by either the chiropractic physician or their physical therapist or maybe a massage therapist that they have a tight, short psoas, they have an anterior pelvic tilt, they have weak glutes, and the strategies to help those individuals because so many of us have received information, myself included. Over 20 years ago, I learned that everyone has a tight, short psoas and weak glutes because everybody sits so much. So one of the things I looked at early on in my clients because I wasn't very successful with a lot of my early patients because of the misinformation that I was taught as well, specifically around the tight short psoas, the weak glutes, and the anterior pelvic tilt. So I did as I was instructed because I didn't have any other reference, and that's an important part about having a lens, and that's why we use the integrative movement system and the principles because that creates a lens for us. But in the beginning, I didn't have any lens, so you have to, so I had to follow the advice that I learned from my teachers and instructors and the courses and the, the con continuing education courses that I went to. So everyone taught me to teach your clients to pull their abs in, squeeze their butt, straighten the, straighten the glutes, stretch out the hip flexors, especially the psoas that's short and tight and creating that sort of anterior pelvic tilt. However, early on, as I said, I wasn't very successful helping very many clients, especially those clients that struggled with chronic low back tightness or discomfort. So I really started to research the concept of why do so many people have low back issues and hip issues? And is it really related to an increased lumbar lordosis and anterior pelvic tilt? Early on, about 15 years ago, there was one person in the world that was doing research on the psoas and glutes, and he was presenting over in Scotland. So back then, Janice and I were just sort of dating, early on in dating. I was teaching here in the United States, so I couldn't go to the conference. So Janice flew over to Scotland to get the information, information directly from that individual that was doing the research on the psoas and glutes, because everybody else was just giving ideas without really having any substantial evidence to prove what they were saying. And this was the first individual, Sean Gibbons was the first individuals, individual that we heard from that really said that the psoas doesn't actually create and contribute to the anterior pelvic tilt. And when we look at the origin and insertion of the psoas, we can see that that's true. It doesn't really, in, it doesn't even insert into the pelvis in a position that can create an anterior pelvic tilted position. Now, when I went to research further, I came up with a lot of research information that I put into this book that just released last year, and it was a number one Amazon bestseller, so thank you if you purchased this book. The SOAS solution contains all the information, the research information that has been done on the SOAS to date. And there isn't a ton of information on the SOAS, so I put all the references in this book because it's very important to us that when we create a strategy that we use with our clients and patients here in our office, that it's backed by research. However, we're not handcuffed by research because a lot of research, researchers do just that. They just research. They don't actually apply the information to their clients, real world individuals. And even clients, I should say research, that looks at real life individuals and uses and puts people through studies, it's very hand selected. They're not just taking random people off the street. They're hand selecting very specific individuals to use for their research studies. So it's important that we look at the research and then also apply the information from the research into our clients' protocols. So that way we get firsthand experience because it's not just about clinical research, as far as I should say research and journal research that's been proven by researchers. It's also the clinical research, what you find when you work with your clients in your gym facilities, in your health clubs, in your clinics. That's when you start to bring this information together and then it's also about best practices. So it's research, it's your own experience, and it's best practices. What are all the people, the best people in your industry doing with the information and how do we tease out the best practices, the best information from those individuals? And that's really what forms our lens, that integrative movement system and how we created this lens that we now look through all this information. So how does that relate to you and your clients that struggle with psoas, glute, anterior pelvic tilt, and more specifically, low back pain? Because the information that I put into the book that I'm gonna share with you in this four part series is exactly the information that comes from the research from our practical experience as well as from 
using this information, this best practice information from our mentors, from people that we travel long and hard to study with to get the information and bring it back to you and share with you both in the resources, the SOAS solution, and as part of this newsletter series. So we really appreciate you joining us and taking in this information. So what do we know about the SOAS and the glutes and how it relates to the anterior pelvic tilt? Well, the psoas attaches from your lower thoracic spine, lumbar spine, it attaches down into the pelvis and then into the front side of the hip joints, so the lesser trochanter. More importantly, it also fascially blends into the diaphragm, transversus abdominis, and then it goes down before it attaches into the pelvis, it fascially blends into the pelvic floor. So it's got fascial attachments to the thoracic spine, lumbar spine, pelvis, the lesser trochanter or the hip, as well as the diaphragm, transverse abdominis, and pelvic floor. So if we look at the attachments of this muscle, first of all, as I mentioned, it doesn't attach anywhere that will create an anterior pelvic tilt. It can create and contribute to an increased lordosis if it's truly short and tight. However, what it actually does is it will inhibit, or should say slow down, prevent excessive anterior pelvic tilt and because of where it attaches to the pelvic floor and to the front side of the pelvis. So it actually contrib contributes, if anything, to posterior pelvic tilting. So it's really much more of a spinal and pelvic stabilizer and stabilizer of the ball, the femoral head within the acetabulum or the socket. So it's much more effective. And that's Sean Gibbons research that we learned way back then, five, 15 years ago. It's much more effective as a stabilizer of this trunk, spine, pelvis, and hip complex than it is as a hip flexor. And actually the research I found, the only research that's out there is that there's one or two studies that say that psoas isn't even an effective hip flexor. So most of the information we have on the psoas isn't accurate. It's based upon what we think it does by its attachments. But when we really look at the attachments of the psoas, it's not even in a great position to create hip flexion. The rectus femoris, the iliacus, the adductors, especially the sartorius, those, I should say, the sartorius is more of an abductor, but those muscles are much more effective hip flexors. The psoas's job is to stabilize the trunk, spine, pelvis, and hip complex, to stabilize the pelvis, and to stabilize the hip joint as these other muscles are taking the hip into a flex position. So that is really what the psoas does, and most individuals are not in an anterior pelvic tilt because most of our clients aren't standing like this because as you're watching this video, just go into hyperextension and you know it doesn't feel good. So most people wouldn't live their life in this position right here. They would prefer to be here where it's much more comfortable. What we generally see as what looks like an anterior pelvic tilt or excessive anterior pelvic tilt is really just hyperextension of the thorax. Is the thorax is being positioned behind the pelvis. So we assume that's anterior pelvic tilt and that's why we've been taught to stretch the psoas and to strengthen the glutes. And what most people will do is they'll just pull their abs in, squeeze their glutes, and it'll, their posture will look better, but it's not a better strategy. So one of the most important concepts we're gonna share with you in this next, the next three parts of this series is you must help your clients develop a more optimal strategy for holding their posture, as well as for movement. And we'll take you through the integrated movement system, which part one is, step one is, discovery and that's where we discover our client's strategy and we assess their strategy because then in part two second step address we address their non-optimal your clients non-optimal and inefficient posture and movement strategy so that way we can help them develop a more optimal and efficient strategy and I'll share that with you in part two and part three of this series where we teach you a very simple assessment and very simple corrective exercise strategy to help your clients develop a more optimal and efficient strategy so they get better function of their psoas as well as their glutes, better posture, and less chronic low back as well as hip issues. So thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Evan Osar with the Institute for Integrative Health and Fitness Education. And we look forward to seeing you at a live event. We've just been traveling to, we just came back from Atlanta. So thank you for all, all of you that joined us at that event and that we share with on this newsletter and in our Facebook Live posts. There's a couple pop quite a few of you that came up and said, hey, thanks for all the great information. So we really appreciate meeting people like Maria from Tennessee and Fit Fred from Atlanta. And now this weekend, we'll be traveling to DC for the DCAC event. Look forward to being at that event. That's one becoming quickly one of our most exciting, most fun events to present at. So we look forward to seeing you there. If you're there, 
come by and say hello. This is Dr. Evan Osar. Make it a great day. We'll see you later this week, Friday, in part two of the series.